For President Bush uh, the first, uh, the 41st president, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, I spent all four years of his presidency on the staff of the National Security Council. Uh, technically, I was a special assistant to the president and senior director for Near East and South Asian Affairs. What that boiled down to is I was uh, his and Brent Scowcroft, who was the National Security Advisor, I was his and Brent Scowcroft's principal advisor on the part of the world that included North Africa, uh, the Middle East, the Israeli-Arab situation, uh, the so-called Persian Gulf, and all the way through Afghanistan, India, and Pakistan, through South Asia. So I did that for all four years. For the second President Bush, the 43rd President, George W., I was in the administration only for two and a half years, from January 2001 through June 2003. And there I had two hats. I was the director of the policy planning staff for the Secretary of State, for Colin Powell. And a second hat, I was a roving ambassador for the administration where I was assigned specific missions. The two most uh, prominent that I was assigned was uh, first after 9-11, I was made the U.S. coordinator for the future of Afghanistan. And then even before that, early on in the administration, I became the U.S. envoy to the Northern Ireland peace process. Well, for outsiders, to be frank, it's rare. For careerists, and I, I am not a careerist, I am not a career foreign service officer or a career military or career intelligence. For careerists, that's, that's the norm. You, you serve, and as administrations come and go, it essentially doesn't uh, matter for the most part. For someone such as myself, who's an outsider, I'm trained as an academic. Uh, I've worked for one Democratic president, for Jimmy Carter at the Pentagon but I worked for Ronald Reagan and I worked for both Presidents Bush, but I also worked for a Democratic senator years before. For outsiders, I would think I'm more the exception. By and large, outsiders come in as political appointees. They tend to have a uh, political alignment, usually if a Democrat, obviously, or, or Republican. Uh, I'm pretty centrist, I think, by, by most accounts. I'm a registered Republican. Uh, but I, I think I was brought in not because of my political uh, affiliation, but rather simply because people in a position of authority, be it, say, a Brent Scowcroft uh, under Bush 41 or Colin Powell under Bush 43, uh, knew me well and simply wanted me to work with them. I thought it was right then and I thought it was right now. I remember the, the conversations in late February 1991, which was at the, when the battlefield phase of the war was ending. And the president and Brent Scrocoff, all of us, Jim Baker, Bob Gates, Dick Cheney, everybody was comfortable with stopping. And the concern was that if we went on towards Baghdad or if we intervened in the various rebellions, the so-called intifadas that sprung up in the South and the North, exactly the kinds of scenarios that we then saw in this more recent Iraq war would happen. And I remember saying to people that, you know, that I feared that more Americans would die in that phase of the war than had died in the entire liberation of Kuwait. And there was simply no, for, there was simply no interest in marching on. We, it wasn't what we, the deal we cut with the Congress. It wasn't the deal we cut with the uh, international community. Militarily, Colin Powell, who was then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, talked about what a nightmare it was going to be on the ground logistically and coordinating with various Iraqi Forces. I remember him standing by the easel, giving the briefing in the, uh, in the Oval Office about, about that. Uh, so for all those reasons, George, w., George Herbert Walker Bush wanted to keep things uh, limited, uh, wanted to essentially stop and not have the United States get bogged down in, in that type of, uh, uh, of a scenario. That was the, the idea was to keep it limited, and we thought that we could bank a lot of goodwill and use that to, among other things, go on and perhaps promote a peace process between Israelis and Arabs, which in fact happened, which was the Madrid Peace Conference several months later. The one assumption that was flawed and that was wrong is that we, we thought Saddam Hussein would likely fall. We, we believed that he would be ousted by his own people for having led them into a, a, a failed war. That proved wrong. What I think proved right, though, was the idea that keeping Iraq intact was a smart idea because that way Iraq could continue to balance Iran. And we still believed at that point that, that Iran, led by uh, these radical uh, mullahs and the rest, was a much greater threat to the Middle East. And one of the ironic results of the more recent Iraq war 
is that Iran is the great strategic victor. Uh, it no longer has to worry about Iraq. Instead, it is Iran that has tremendous influence, not simply in Iraq, but throughout the Middle East, with Hamas, with Hezbollah, and so forth. So we were playing balance of power politics in the first Iraq war. And in the second uh, Iraq war, the Bush administration of George W. did not play balance of power politics. And the result is they, they led to an imbalance of power that favored Iran. It's something I ask myself a lot, and you know, I wrote more memos than I can count, making the case both that we had viable alternatives to going to war, but also about if we were going to go to war, how to do it in a smart way, and if we were going to do, and then if we were going to go to war, we had to plan for an aftermath, and how to do that in a smart way. And my frustration is that virtually everything I recommended at every phase was ignored or rejected. Uh, it's not so much that I wished I had argued harder. I wished I had had more opportunities to argue it out. Uh, I've been in government a lot in my life, and you, you never win them all. You don't expect to. But you really do want your day in court. You want your chance. And what was so frustrating to me about this administration, the second Bush administration, is I, I, I essentially felt that people with my views never got their day in court. That there wasn't a National Security Council process that guaranteed that divergent views would really have their, their chance and that things would be argued out. Now, I have no illusions that even if I had had every chance in the world that things would have been fundamentally different. Uh, I don't think it would have happened given where people, where the center of this administration was after 9-11 and given the, I thought, a fateful decision by the uh, National Security uh, Advisor, by Condoleezza Rice and by the President, to put responsibility for the Iraq aftermath in the hands of the Defense Department. I thought that was a terrible decision. It's a little bit like playing tennis and having someone not just be your opponent but calling all the lines. And I thought the Pentagon should have oversight of the security dimension of things but should not have oversight of the overall policy. That ought to have stayed in the White House. And it's interesting, several years later it was ultimately moved to the White House where it should have been, uh, where it should have been all, all along. So I have tremendous frustrations with the policy. Obviously, I disagreed with it. I had uh, frustrations with how the intelligence wasn't listened to. Uh, but again, I don't believe, given the political balance or imbalance in this administration, that I would have, I would have prevailed regardless of what opportunities I was, given, I was given to make my case.